Okay, it is a great honor and pleasure to deliver this opening lecture at our celebration of Pat's birthday. I begin on a personal note. Although I was acquainted with Pat's work in philosophy of science, philosophy of physics, foundations of measurement, and foundations of probability, dot, 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 before coming to Stanford in 2002, the best of the many good experiences I have had since arriving here has been becoming better acquainted with Pat himself. Working with him in connection with the Sufi Center for the History and Philosophy of Science, and even more, getting to know him personally through many, many stimulating conversations, stimulating my underline, concerning, among other things, the relationship between science and philosophy. This is the topic on which I shall speak today. I shall try to delineate Pat's unique perspective on this issue, and more generally to show that Pat's extraordinarily broad-ranging and diverse body of work amounts to a new and not yet sufficiently appreciated, at least among professional philosophers, contribution to the ongoing development of the tradition in scientific philosophy that began with the efforts of the Vienna Circle and related groups in Central Europe in the 20s and 30s, the 1920s and 30s, and continued in this country after the great intellectual migration that took place before, during, and after the Second World War. Here it was enriched by the tradition of American pragmatism, a healthy dose of, dose of which Pat absorbed as a graduate student in philosophy at Columbia after the war. He was there influenced especially by Ernest Nagel, who was one of the most important creators of the subdiscipline we now call philosophy of science during this period, along with Rudolf Carnap, Peter Hempel, and Hans Reichenbach. The first point to make about Pat, however, is that although he has in fact made central contributions to this subdiscipline, the philosophy of science, he is not a philosopher of science in the standard sense. The concept of scientific philosophy, which I've already used, fits better insofar as it implied in the late 19th and early 20th century context in which it was developed, a revolutionary effort to replace the entire academic discipline of philosophy as it had come to be practiced with a new orientation devoted to much closer cooperation with the sciences themselves. Yet even though it makes good sense to take Pat to be an inheritor of this tradition, the concept of scientific philosopher as it was used by the Vienna Circle may still seem too narrow in his case. For Pat, as we know, is equally or even more devout, devoted to making original ongoing contributions to science, and indeed to a number of scientific disciplines. Thus, Pat is one of only three contemporary philosophers who are members of both the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the National Academy of Science, together with our own Brian Skirms and Alan Gibbard at Michigan. And one of the things of which Pat is justly most proud is being awarded the National Medal of Science in 1990. That's the first thing on your handout, the statement there. I don't think I need to do it. Although this is an excellent summary of some of Pat's important contributions, this certainly does not sound like the profile of a typical philosopher of science, or even if there is such a thing, a typical scientific philosopher. Pat is well aware of the unique nature of his enterprise. He puts it this way towards the end of the second part of his intellectual autobiography. His first part, the first and second parts are available online at his website. All the quotes you see, except the ones that are marked otherwise, come from that. He says he had worked both in philosophy and science. He continues to do and continues to have great interest in the philosophy of science. But it's certainly true that in many respects, most of my energy, he says, has been devoted to scientific activities. The two main areas are psychology, above all, and physics. He could take, he says, I could take another line and say that a distinction between philosophy of science and science is in itself incorrect. In many ways, I am sympathetic with, su with such a summary of Quine's view, namely that philosophy should mainly be philosophy of science, and philosophy of science should mainly itself be science. I shall return to Pat's relation to Quine, and also to his relation to Carnap. Quine's teacher and later great, great adversary. Hello. My second point, however, concerns Pat's distinctive brand of philosophical empiricism, which, which once again is also quite unique. The next thing I'm going to hand, hand out. Here, Pat says charmingly, he sometimes liked to describe this influence in a self-praising way, that is, of his scientific work, 
by claiming that I am the only genuinely empirical <laughs> empiricist, philosopher that he knows. It is surprising how little concern for scientific details is to be found in the great empirical tradition in philosophy. It has been a point with me to cite scientific data and not just scientific theories whenever it seems pertinent. Pat's philosophical empiricism thus involves a commitment to empirical science as a paradigm of knowledge and a consequent commitment to closely attending to the details of this science, both theoretical and empirical. And here, Pat's philosophical practice could not be more different from Quine's, who, although the most celebrated recent proponent of philosophical empiricism, Quine, appears paradoxically to be wholly uninterested in the details of any real empirical science, with the possible exception of a rather superficial fragment of behavioristic psychology. That could almost be a quote from Pat. <laughs> However, and this is my third point, although Pat's philosophical practice is unusually attentive to empirical data, and his scientific practice is centrally concerned with developing detailed ways of testing theoretical hypotheses, a very large part of Pat's intellectual practice, both philosophical and scientific, revolves around formal mathematical work on axiomatic foundations. Much of his early work in the 1950s, for example, concerned the axiomatic foundations of mechanics, including axiomatic foundations for special relativity in the tradition we now identify as beginning with A.A. Robb. Pat then turned in the 60s to the foundations of probability in connection with the foundations of quantum mechanics and embarked on a program for analyzing the phenomenon of non-commutativity or incompatibility between conjoint quantum magnitudes or observables, such as position and momentum, for example, or different directions of spin, in terms of the non-existence of joint distributions for the associated random variables. During this same period, moreover, he embarked on an ambitious and wide-ranging program in the foundations of measurement theory, which culminated in the now classic three-volume treatise, Foundations of Measurement, appearing in 1971, 1989, and 1990, respectively, I think the 89 one was Pat's responsibility, which is why it was delayed so long. Written with David Krantz, Duncan Bruce, and Amos Tversky. This work both created the formal axiomatic theory of measurement and developed it in extraordinary detail. This is Pat, believe it or not. The central concept of this theory is that of representation theory, which formally explains the connection between the qualitative relations characterizing a given empirical domain, such as the relation of heavier than between different masses or weights, warmer than between different reheated objects, and so on. The relevant representation theorem says roughly that for any model satisfying the appropriate axioms for these relations, there is a function from the objects in the domain into the real numbers that is unique up to a certain class of transformations, characteristic of a ratio scale or an interval scale, and so on. Or, to put it another way, any model for these axioms is isomorphic to a purely numerical model, which is again unique up to the same class of transformations. The historical source for this type of axiomatic foundation is Hilbert's celebrated work on the foundations of geometry, first published in 1899, which aimed, among other things, thereby to explain the connection between synthetic and analytic geometry. Thus, any model for Hilbert's axioms of incidence, order, congruence, and so on, in general, a qualitative or synthetic model, no numbers in it, is isomorphic to a model in the domain of pairs of real numbers, a numerical or analytic model, where the appropriate class of transformations under which the relations in the model are invariant, in this Hilbert case, is given by the Euclidean group, rotations and translations, plus dilations, where the latter signify an arbitrary choice of unit of measurement. This extension and generalization of the Hilbertian style of formal axiomatics, that is, by, by uh, Pat and his co-workers, to a formal theory of measurement for a great variety of possible physical magnitudes, including not only classical extensive magnitudes like length, but also what we now call intensive magnitudes, like phenomenological temperature. And even more notably, extending to the measurement of psychological magnitudes, such as subjective probabilities and utilities as well. This, I say, was a magnificent mathematical achievement, and I don't expect much argument, at least from Pat, on this one. <laughs> Moreover, it is perhaps not too much to say that the fundamental ideas of representation, isomorphism and its generalizations and invariance, 
lie at the core of all of Pat's scientific and philosophical work. Indeed, his 2002 book, Representation and Invariance of Scientific Structures, uses 